So today we're going to be continuing in our series looking at the book of Acts. And today we're looking at Paul's third missionary journey, which is roughly uh, 53 to 58 AD. And this journey is in many ways retracing of the second journey across modern day Turkey and Greece. And we're introduced to a man named Apollos who appears again in the Corinthian letters. And we hear about John the Baptist's disciples, Jewish exorcists, uh, riots and more travels. We read in Acts 18, uh, 22 to 23, that when he arrived in Caesarea, this is Paul, he went up and greeted the church in Jerusalem and then went down to Antioch. After he spent some time there, Paul left and went through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So in this passage, uh, Luke is describing Paul's aim with this third mission as strengthening all the disciples. And Paul is planting these diverse communities where all people have equal worth, uh, whether they're Jew or Greek, slave or free, uh, civilised or barbarian whether they're male or female, and where the good news is being shared in their words and in their actions, and where all the believers are trusting in the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit within their own lives. And in Acts 18 verses 24 to 25, we're introduced to another key evangelist in this early messianic uh, Jewish movement, and that's another Jew named Apollos. And we read, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, arrived in Ephesus. He was an eloquent speaker, well versed in the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. And with great enthusiasm, he spoke and taught accurately the facts about Jesus. Although he knew only of the baptism of John. So we're told here that Apollos is from Alexandria. And Alexandria was founded by Alexander the Great. It was in Egypt and perhaps best known for the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And its great library, the largest in the ancient world. And it was the capital of Egypt for a thousand years. It was the centre of Greek civilization. It was a place where the Old Testament was first translated into Greek. It was the second largest city in the Roman Empire and home to over 100,000 Jews. As such, it quickly became one of the very centres of Christianity and the home of the first theological college. And from the text, we're told that Apollos, number one, is he's a great speaker. Number two, that he knows the Old Testament scriptures really well. And he number three, that he knows and teaches facts about Jesus. But he doesn't have the whole story. Apollos knows only of the baptism of John. And in Matthew 3, uh, 11, we read about John the Baptist's words. I baptise you with water for repentance. But one who is coming after me, who's more powerful than I am, and I'm not worthy to carry his sandals, he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Apollos knows about water baptism for repentance. He knows facts about Jesus, but he doesn't have the full story, as it were. Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and they explain the faith more accurately to him. And Luke positions this story next to a very similar story about some disciples who knew about Jesus from John the Baptist, but yet hadn't received the Holy Spirit. Luke writes in Acts 19 verses 1 to 6, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through the inland regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples there and said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they replied, no, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul said, into what then were you baptised? Into John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John baptised with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who is coming after him, that is in Jesus. Then they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul placed his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. So in this passage and in the passage about Apollos, Luke is making an interesting point here about water baptism and facts about Jesus are good, but they're incomplete without the change of heart brought about with the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. 
in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, the promise of this new covenant is that the law is going to be written on the heart. It's about the indwelling presence of the spirit that's going to bring about inward transformation. You know, Jesus talks about, you know, uh, whitewashed tombs, you know, the outside they're all pretty, but inside they're dead. And in the same way that although we could have lots of good works outwardly, we can be dead on the inside. We need the Holy Spirit to come inside us to change us and bring about transformation. And in Romans 5, 5, Paul writes, the love of God has been poured about in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And in Ephesians 3, 19, he prays that they might know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So for Christians then, what matters is not that we know facts about Jesus or that we've received water baptism, but that we've received the Holy Spirit and have come to know the love of God that has been poured into our hearts, that this love, this passion changes us. In Galatians 5, uh, 9, 16 and 17 we read, but I say, live by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the spirit and the spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For they're in opposition to each other so that you cannot do what you want. So the love of God that's poured into our hearts changes us and makes us love the good. There's this war going on within each of us, the spirit and the flesh and we're instructed to live by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh that we need this internal change of heart laws written upon stone couldn't change us laws written upon the heart however can we need these new desires new loves instilled within us by his grace and the presence of the holy spirit so paul writes in romans 8 12 through to 14 so then brothers and sisters we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you live according to the flesh then you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body then you will live for all who are led by the spirit of god are the sons of god so there's this very old christian saying if you die before you die then when you die you will not die it's the way of the flesh is death we we are dust we're made of dust and earthly living will only return us to dust but if we die to the pattern of that life and live in the spirit then we partake of a form of life in the spirit that survives after death we will live Friends, there's a warning to each of us here. If we live according to the flesh, we're only storing up treasures that are going to rot and fade away. They're dust and will return to dust. There's no life in that. But if we kill those sins in our life, and if we store up treasures that are going to last forever, then in the words of John Owen, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Uh, Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and 13. When I was a child, I taught like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I set aside those childish ways. For now we see in a mirror indirectly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully just as I've been fully known. And now these things remain, faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. So these three theological virtues, faith, hope and love, embody a form of life that survives after death. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, each builder's work will be plainly seen for the day, the day, it's the day of judgment, will make it clear because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each has done. If what someone has built survives, then he will receive the reward. If someone's work is burnt up, he will suffer lost. He himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Friends, none of us want to arrive on that day and discover that the things that we devoted our lives to, the things that we invested all of our time, all of our energy in, meant nothing as they pass through the flames and are consumed. We want rather things that will survive through death. 
through the fire that takes everything and the uh, things that will remain. The Holy Spirit, friends, is the spirit of holiness. He's the one who comes inside us in order to make us holy, to become separated from this world, to be dedicated to the work of God in the world. And if you don't have him, then you need him. You might have been baptised with water as the followers of John were. You might know facts about Jesus, but Jesus is the one who baptises with the Holy Spirit. According to John Wesley, when God commands, thou shalt not lie, it means both I command you not to lie, but also I will bring about, bring it about that you will become one who does not lie. So the words of Isaiah 26, 12 all of our works thou O God has wrought in us or as the NIV has it that all we have accomplished you have done for us friends it's we who accomplish things but it is God who works them in us so without the Holy Spirit we're unable to put to death our flesh and to live towards God and this baptism is an experience of God's love that we might become like Jesus through faith expressed in love and if you don't have that today if that's not your reality today then ask for it ask God for it in Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus says if you then though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him Paul in Galatians 5, 24 to 25 writes, Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, then let us behave in accordance with the Spirit. So friends, if we claim to be followers of Jesus the Messiah, if we claim to walk in his manner of living, then we must pick up our own crosses. And die to those sinful ways of living. We must kill the sin in our life. Why not ask the Holy Spirit today to reveal to you what areas of your life need working on? What areas of your life need to be transformed? What areas of your life you need to repent of? Luke tells us in um, that Paul remained in Ephesus for two years. And during that time we're told that God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. So that when even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his body brought to the sick that their diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. And I've mentioned before that God often uses these very physical means to heal us, uh, whether the laying on of hands or of oil or some other means. In Numbers 21, it's only those who look at the bronze serpent who are healed. And in first, uh, Second Kings Thirteen twenty one. a man is resurrected simply because his body has touched the bones of Elisha. God's not limited by our means, but rather he chooses to work through these symbols for us. And Luke informs us uh, that following a failed exorcism by some non-Messianic Jews, fear came over the whole city and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. And many people could see that the believers in the Messiah had spiritual power. Acts 19, 18 to 20, we read, Many of those who believed came forward, confessing and making their deeds known. Large numbers of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in the presence of everyone. Then the value of the books was added up. It was found that 550,000 silver coins. In this way, the word of the Lord continued to grow in power and to prevail. In the Western world, especially since the Enlightenment, the idea of magic or witchcraft has often been cast aside as ancient superstition, along with doctrines such as the Trinity or that God has become man. And as Christians, we could can, we continue to believe in such things because the Bible talks about such things as realities. Andrew Lang, an anthropologist, spoke about the falling away of all ancient cultures from a primitive monotheism, belief in one God, to belief in many gods because a moral creator god does not need gifts and is opposed to lust or to mischief and he's not going to help us with love spells or sending disease upon others by witchcraft he will not favor one person over his neighbor or one tribe above its rivals as a reward for sacrifice 
However, lesser fallen spirits, on the other hand, have no such hesitations. They're happy in exchange for sacrifice or honour to help one person or one tribe over and above another. And magic and witchcraft are about control. It's about getting assistance from spirits through rituals and incantations in order to control others, to get protection from curses or to send a curse upon someone else, to get someone to love you. Or in verse 19, we read large numbers of those who have practiced magic collected their books and they burned them in the presence of everyone. And friends, you might not be offering sacrifices to demons in order to try and control or manipulate others. Uh, friends, we might not be burning books today, but burn your desire to control and manipulate others. Burn your desire to manipulate others. Burn your power over others. Pick up your cross and serve and love your neighbour. Paul in Philippians 2 5 says you should have the same attitude towards each other that Jesus Christ had and Jesus in Mark 10 45 says even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so often it is that we want to be served we want to be loved we want others to come to us, make us feel better. But are we willing to be the change that we want to see? Are we willing to serve others? If we want to be loved, are we willing to love others first? If we want to, others to always make the first move, are we willing to make the first move? Are we like Jesus, ready to serve and give our lives for the many? Husbands, are you willing to love and put your wife's needs before your own? Wives, are you willing to honour and respect your husbands? Are we willing to treat others as we would like them to treat us? Employees, are you willing to submit even to bad employers, knowing that Christ also suffered injustice? The very heart of Christianity is the death of self, giving up our desire to control, to manipulate others, but rather to love them for their sake alone, because generally we want to see them healed and restored and having success in this life. And that's why we stage our own deaths through baptism. And in Hebrews 2, 14 to 15, we read about the coming of Christ, for it is written, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who lived their lives as slaves to fear of dying. So Jesus came to destroy the fear of death by dying and rising again. And he would change the use of death, turn it inside out. Um, before, it was something terrible that was used to control and to manipulate us, to enslave us to the world, the flesh and the devil. That we thought there is nothing beyond death. I'm scared. I'm going to cling to the things of this life, cling to them dearly and build my life upon these foundations of things that are temporary. But knowing that death has been overcome, knowing that there is a resurrection, knowing that death isn't the end, but rather it is the beginning. It is the the tomb is the womb to new life knowing that then we're free we're free not to cling to the things of this life but rather to give them up and to live a life in the service of others and that had been the plan all along even before the universe had been formed the fear of death god knew would always enslave us and so he planned before the foundations of the earth to send the slaughtered lamb who would rise again to teach us not to fear death so that we could live free sacrificially for the sake of the other to love our neighbor and sin is the love of those created things rather than living as if death has been overcome and in hebrews 6 1 to 2 we read let us stop going over the basic teachings about christ again and again but let us go on to become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again. 
with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds, placing our faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptisms or laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And the author lists these basic teaching of the messianic movement of turning away from dead sin, dead deeds, evil deeds, turning away from those previous patterns of life. Faith in God, baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. The importance of stories we've been exploring this morning is that the Holy Spirit brings an experience of God's love that can change us on the inside, that we desire to stop sinning and to become like Jesus through faith that is expressed outwardly as love. And this means that we burn our books on how to control and to manipulate others, that we stop fellowshipping with those wicked spirits that seek to control and to manipulate others, that we enter into a pattern of life that is marked by death as we take up our cross and follow Christ in his way of life. Friends, we serve the risen, crucified one. Crucified one. And that is why it's important that we do have those images of the cross in our own lives, that we do meditate on the image of the cross, that we do think about the Christ on the cross, not just him as his glorious resurrection um, and his power over death, but that we remember that death is the way to life. Death is the way to life. That's why the image of Christ on the cross is a needed image in all of our lives. The crucifixion, that death is the way to new life. Jesus shows us what it is to be God by the way that he dies as a man in self-sacrificial love for his neighbour. That if our lives are to conform to God, to the, that reality, the having been made in the image of God, that we would become like God, then we do so through death, through dying to ourselves. That to be like God is shown by the way that he has died as a man. That it is through death, through self-sacrificial giving of ourselves for others. Following these events, Paul resolved to go back to Jerusalem via Greece. And in Ephesus, a riot broke out as people felt that the preaching of this Jewish sect, as they saw it, was upsetting the status quo. They were per persuading pagans to stop sacrificing to gods and to, to worship the Jewish god. And Paul travelled all through Greece and Macedonia and then sailed back across the Aegean to Troas, to the land of ancient Troy. And then they sailed again and Paul's in two minds about visiting the Ephesian elders and they sail past Ephesus and then they arrive at Miletus. And having arrived in Miletus, Paul decides that he does not uh, want to speak with the Ephesian elders. So they, actually he does. Sorry. He does want to speak with the Ephesian elders and they've already sailed past Ephesus. And so he sends messenger to get them. And the messenger is probably most likely his companion Trophimus, who was himself from Ephesus and probably you know, knows the local layout, knows the local land. And it's a 45 mile journey. So just going from it's like going from here to somewhere between Salisbury and Southampton from here. You know, so perhaps, you know, that's 45 miles there, 45 miles back. You know, Paul's waiting there perhaps five days for, before the elders arrive. And then he gives them a speech. And I'm just going to quote part of it. He speaks to the Ephesian elders here in Acts 20, 20 to 23. He says, you know that I did not hold back from proclaiming to you everything that would be helpful and from teaching you publicly from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem without knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit warns me in town after town that imprisonment and persecutions are awaiting me. So he continued instructing them and then they prayed said their goodbyes and then they accompany him to his ship so they could say goodbye and they cry as they say goodbye to him and this is a perfect ending for next week as we look at the final chapters of acts as paul is arrested and as he's put on trial 
And in conclusion, friends, the events surrounding the polis, around John the Baptist's disciples, about the burning of the magic book should speak into the very heart of what it is to be a Christian, to be a follower of the Messiah. It's a call to a pattern of life that is marked by death, to cease building and storing up treasures here that are going to rust and go and fade. Instead, to seek a pattern of life that is marked by faith, hope and love. And to do this, we need the Holy Spirit. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would come uh, again by the Spirit. You would fill us afresh. All those who are watching today, Lord, that you would fill them by your Spirit and come upon them where they're at, Lord. You would come and meet with them. Lord, convict them of those sins in their lives that are, are drawing them back from that sweeter, more intimate fellowship with yourself. And Lord, we pray that you are conforming us to the image of the Son. You're making us more and more like Jesus day by day. And so we pray, Lord, that you would draw us to yourself through death, the death in, in our lives every day as we're giving up uh, those patterns of behaviour, those patterns of living, Lord, that, cha that draw us back and that are just building a foundation on the earth that is going to fade rather than a pattern of life built upon faith, hope and love that will live forever. Come afresh through the Spirit, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.